since we're going to talk about central nervous system pharmacology today, uh, I thought I'd show you uh, some cool things going on with Alzheimer's disease because later on today we're going to talk about medications for Alzheimer's disease and I wanted you to see something very current uh, going on with the diagnostics of Alzheimer's disease. Currently there's no cure for Alzheimer's disease. Every time we think we're headed in the right direction, uh, finding something promising with Alzheimer's, it doesn't seem to work out. And it's been very frustrating. If you've been following this disease like I have for what, 30 years, it's very frustrating to see that the directions that research goes uh, ends up at a dead end and we end up having to start over. Uh, however, later on we're going to talk about cholinesterase inhibitors, centrally acting cholinesterase inhibitors that can help prevent the progression of the disease. They don't reverse the disease, but they can really slow down the progression, and that's the best that we can do with Alzheimer's right now, and we'll talk about that in a later lecture. So if we can give these treatments early in the course of the disease, we can prevent the progression of the disease. And so this has inspired in scientists for decades to come up with earlier and earlier ways of diagnosing Alzheimer's disease. All right, one of the difficulties with Alzheimer's disease is by the time the doctors figure out the symptoms, uh, too many cells have died in the brain and it's really too late. It's irreversible. And so something I wanted to show you about these two brains, this is a normal brain other than it's been removed from the skull. And uh, this is a brain with Alzheimer's disease. And know these, the little sulci, the grooves in the brain, uh, they're larger than a normal brain. Those the sulci are larger because the neurons have died causing the brain to shrink. And we can see this on an MRI scan. Yes, they're weighted and contrasted differently, uh, but they're essentially the same slice. And you can see here in a normal brain, the ventricles are normal sized. And here the ventricles are very large. The lateral ventricles are very large in somebody with dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And that's not because the ventricles are larger, it's because the neurons are dying, taking up less space. That's what's making the ventricles larger. The other thing is you can see uh, the little grooves in the brain are getting larger as well, and that's not because the grooves are getting bigger, that's because the brain's getting smaller, the neurons are dying, so the brain is shrinking. But by the time we see this, too many neurons have died, the disease is essentially irreversible. All right, so a common type of brain scan is called a PET scan, a positron emission tomography scan. A positron emission tomography scans measure the level of specific molecules like glucose in the brain, and have been investigated uh, as a tool to help diagnose Alzheimer's disease before the symptoms become uh, severe. All right, in the first lecture, we talked about electrons. Uh, and, and if you've ever heard of antimatter, there is such a thing as antimatter. And a positron is actually the antimatter of an electron. And so we can take any kind of molecule. And since the brain uses glucose as a fuel, we will take the glucose molecule and we'll put a little radioactive tag on it so when the brain consumes it, uh, it gives off a positron and then we can measure that positron in the machine. So we've been using these scans for a long time trying to detect Alzheimer's disease. There are other things that we can tag besides glucose to do scans to look for Alzheimer's disease, but those tend to be very expensive and hard to come by and so that's why they're using uh, glucose-based uh, positron emission tomography for this study. However, because the disease is a slow progressive disorder, the changes in glucose are very subtle and these are difficult to detect with the naked eye, but keep in mind that this is a digital scan. And so with machine algorithms, we can see very, 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 very subtle changes in the digital image uh, that we'll never be able to see with our eyes. And so using machine algorithms to look at digital images is one of the cutting edge things that we're doing with uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence in medicine. All right, so researchers used this machine learning algorithm and they ran the PET scans through it to help diagnose early stage Alzheimer's disease more reliably and I think we are all shocked by the outcomes. All right, so you, with the machine learning algorithm, you kind of have to train it. So to train the algorithm, the researchers presented it with images from Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging initiative. And you can Google that and read all about it. But it's a massive public data set of PET scans from patients who were eventually diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or mild cognitive impairment.
or no disorder at all. So the machine gets to compare these images and then it goes through its little algorithm and is able to subtract away uh, the images that are normal and pinpoint the changes that are going on in these digital images that would suggest Alzheimer's disease. Eventually, the algorithm began to learn on its own which features were important for predicting the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and which are not. The algorithm correctly identified 92% of patients who developed Alzheimer's disease in the first test and 98% in the second test. What's more, it made these, predict, uh, made these correct predictions on average uh, about six years before the patient received their final diagnosis. So the next step is to feed this machine algorithm even more and more and more and more and more and more uh, positron scans. Uh, the more it learns, uh, the more accurate uh, the machine will become. And so before the, the algorithm can actually be clinically revel relevant, uh, we're going to need to validate it and calibrate it uh, using a larger data set. And this is normal how research goes. All right. But if the algorithm can withstand the test of time, then researchers think that we can use this as a tool uh, as soon as the radiologist sees a patient at a clinic and a predictive diagnostic tool for Alzheimer's disease. Because the sooner we can start treating people who show signs of Alzheimer's disease, uh, the more we can slow the progression. Because the medications that we are using today, the centrally acting cholinesterase inhibitors, are slowing the progression of the disease. And if we can start them sooner, then we can stop the progression of the disease. On that note, this morning, uh, Kaiser Health News uh, sent out this link uh, talking about common classes of drugs that seem to increase the risk of dementia. And those are going to be some of the drugs that we talk about today. And then we're going to talk about those drugs again when we talk about serotonin, histamine, and the ergot alkaloids. All right, cholinergic drugs, cholinomimetic drugs, centrally acting drugs that work on the brain that affect acetylcholine that increase acetylcholine levels indirectly by blocking acetylcholinesterase. Those drugs are used to slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease. Well, then it makes sense that centrally acting anticholinergic drugs can increase the risk of dementia. And we're just now starting to look at what kind of uh, choline uh, antagonists are causing dementia. And so uh, some of the old antihistamines that we'll talk about, some of the old anticholinergic drugs, because some of the older antihistamines have anticholinergic effects. And so between histamine blockade, there's an overlap between histamine blockade and acetylcholine blockade. And we're starting to investigate these drugs to see if they are contributing to the risk of Alzheimer's disease.